my pleasure to chair this session, but I have a first question for you. It's a very important question, and you should reply it responsibly. <laughs> what language should be used? English or Polish? Who doesn't understand Polish? Two. Okay. <laughs> Unless you spoke really slowly. <laughs> like so slowly that we would be here for, I don't know, like six or seven hours. Oh, you know, I thought that, you know, the language should suit the debate, so, in a way. Okay. As you perhaps know, our session is addressed to Professor Anna Cinciola, one of the few Polish historians with worst career. That's the reason I am asking you to allow me, before starting our discussion, on foreign policy of Poland, to introduce Professor Chen Chao. I was told, I'm not sure if it's worth words, uh, but I was told that Professor will listen and see our debate. Uh, so, in a way, she will be with us today, even if not be able to come in person. But in a way, on behalf of all gathered here, I would like to pass the best wishes to Professor Chinchawa. All the best to you, if you can really see us. <laughs> and so, I think that, you know, even if it's perhaps not possible uh, to specialize in the issues of foreign policy of Poland or in the history of Poland and in the modern international relations, not knowing the works of Professor Cinciawa, uh, I would like to introduce some of her achievements in, uh, and her CV. She was born in the city of Gdańsk. Fortunately, she left the place for England and finished her primary and secondary education there. At the, they entered the Liverpool University and obtained a BA diploma in modern European history. Then she moved once more, not for the last time, to Canada and from the McGill Montreal University got a master degree. Her decision on entering the, the path of scientific life was ready then, and then she met Professor Piotr Bandic, who became an advisor on her, doc on her doctoral dissertation. Her teaching career developed uh, at the Ottawa and then Toronto universities before she decided to move to Kansas in 1965. She taught the courses on East Central Europe in the 19th and 20th century, colonies and nationalism in this region, history of Poland from partition to present times. Professor Cinciawa specializes in the Polish European Soviet and American diplomacy in the period of 1919 and 1945. She published, published 202 works, <laughs> That's an enormous amount. So I will not introduce all the, of these works, fortunately to you, but maybe not fortunately for the subject. Some of the titles, the Poland and the Western Powers in 1938, 1939, from Versailles to Locarno, the mini crisis, Poland and British and French diplomacy in 1939, the Nazi-Soviet Pact of, of August 24. Sorry, the foreign policy of Piłsudski and Wieserberg, an unknown page of history deposed the court to the USSR 1940-1941. So there are the main books and parts of the books she prepared. Before putting some light on her latest work about Captain Massacre, let me add something more personal. It's really personal. We met twice for the first time in 1979, when she was a guest of the University Institute of Historical of History, and my husband was asked to comfort her stay. It's now 35 years. 
uh, since that time, and I still remember what I had served for the dinner in Frankfurt. <laughs> so <laughs> it was some uh, great event for me. So I prepared the lamp with Vitru, uh, what I said for the first time in my life. So I was not sure, sure enough about the result of this, what, if I am able to prepare the dish properly. So I asked Piotr Adamczewski from the Weekly Politica to help me and to make some prizes how to prepare. And I think that we managed, uh, so the meat was eatable. Uh, but <laughs> even if it was not, I think the professor wouldn't show her disappointment. It's the time of the person. I never have seen her not smiling, not open, not open to help other people. And I think that it seems to be her attitude for everyday conduct as well for her scientific life. Perhaps also in this room and there are people who enjoy her generosity, advice and mentoring growth. For the second time, this time on the professional ground, we were in touch with preparation of professors cut in a crime without punishment issued by Yale University with Professor Chinchara's introduction. The book was a fruit of the temporary openness of Russian archives, the cooperativeness shown by the Russian government, and have words of many Peter researchers, including Professor Lebedeva, Professor Matejski, and many others. As a director of Polish State Archives at the time, I was responsible for the Polish edition. Thanks to Professor Cinciawa and previously to Professor Zabotnin, Katyn Massacre is now better known in the world. Maybe that's not yet, but we are doing our best, and I think that. We should look for followers of Professor Jin Chao to do this job and to continue the job. So, but anyway, this volume was gigantic and very meaningful, uh, I think that for all of us. So that's why I would like to thank you, or to tell thank you to Professor Jin Chao for her talents, for her skills, generosity, openness, good sense of humor. I would like to thank her for everything. I think that Professor Cornett will follow this introduction by looking into her books, some of her books. So I think that I did the job of introducing Professor Jin Chao, who we know whom we were dedicating our debate, and now I would like to switch to the debate. And maybe, if I may, ask the speakers. Unfortunately, there are only two of them, so I think the discussion will be very fruitful because we will have some time. Uh, and as Professor Chen Chao is doing this, always bridging the past with contemporary times, trying to find the past from what happened to. Uh, to some examples how this would happen can influence our uh, contemporary activities. And so I think that uh, as the topics are not overlapping and uh, we have to find some, something that would overlap in uh, the subject. Uh, I would like to, to, uh, to, to put or formulate a general question about the choices of Poland. If Poland in this interval period had any choices, was a passive or active sub sub subject of inter international relations? I think that this question is very important also nowadays. Could the country like Poland, situated in this place, uh, of this character of the economy, can influence the international policy really? When and why and how it is possible that it would be able to, to do something important uh, and or we are somehow to the side and the history runs the side of us. So uh, and first one is Professor Stavomir Chisek. Sorry, I've made one of two. 
So Chisa is a very friendly guy here, so we will wait for him. Professor uh, Slavomir Debski, who works at the Institute of History at the Warsaw University, but graduated from the Aguilonian University uh, since 207, had till 210, around the Polish Institute of International Affairs, now become the director of the Center for Polish Russian Dialogue and Understanding. She's, uh, she's, uh, he uh, specializes in the Soviet German relations. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. It is a great honor for me to uh, contribute to the fashion which uh, was thought as a. It doesn't work. Okay, try it. <laughs> Departure for my today's intervention and 
um, as an introduction to our discussion. Firstly, uh, this book uh, is today the classical take on crucial challenge Poland's foreign policy faces face after the rebirth of Polish independence. It also describes well the crucial problem caused by the myths and stereotypes about Poland and its foreign policy, with which Anna Cinciawa has, has had to fight with for her whole professional career as a historian of uh, Polish foreign policy. Today's, today's session was for a tribute to Anna Cinciawa, and it, it is a great uh, honor to, to uh, start this session uh, you know, with this part of the reference. Secondly, the quote bring, brings us immediately into important context in which Poland's diplomacy had to operate in the mm -hmm. first years. Poland was viewed by the Western powers as a hardly sustainable political actor, fully dependent on the will and the support of the powers behind the South order. We should bear in mind that, that, that for the politicians in Paris, London, Rome, Berlin, even in Washington, culture and well-educated people. Politics among the nations may meant in the practice, in practical terms, politics among the powers. And only within the framework of this logic, the creation of new states in the East could have been properly understood. Thus in France, the logic of power politics explained French support for the rebirth of Poland seen as a tool of checking Germany in the East and keeping the Bolsheviks out of Europe. Still, taking the mindset of French political elite of the time, it went without question that all educated people should have understood that this policy went against classical rules of politics and the nations of Eastern Europe, including obviously Poland, were expected to be simply grateful to France for its enormous contribution to their to the very existence uh, and they, this gratitude should express itself in granting France a privileged terms of economic cooperation. Polish diplomats recognized as early as in the time of the Paris Peace Conference in June 1990 that, I quote, France clearly, clearly War works against our economic interests. <coughs> Trying to compensate somehow its support for our politi political claims. And of course. Suddenly it appeared that Poland being in need of economic and financial aid could not have counted on France assistance. After the Polish Soviet war, France became Poland's most important ally had given both moral and martial, material support and enjoyed great prestige and influence there. But Polish-French relations were clearly asymmetric, as we would call it today, with the Federals paying very little attention, if any, to Polish strategic and economic interests. Well, what about Great Britain? It is widely known that with our Britain's situation was even worse. However, British politicians of the time were aware of the necessity of creation of new independent state in the East, as it was the only practical solution to tackle the miserable consequences of great geopolitical catastrophe, the fall of the Tsar's empire, and what was much more welcome and endorsed, disintegration of after Hungarian state. But in their arms, Poland's right for existence were limited and should be satisfied only within the borders of more or less the Kingdom of Poland established in the Congress of Vienna of 1850. All theoretical claims of Poland that went beyond this justified uh, uh, um, by history or geographic tradition borders were seen in London at best as non practical thus causing troubles for European politics. Meaning, the state of nature of politics among European powers all were perceived as a part of French, French plot aimed at securing France an upper hand not only over Germany, but more generally in Europe's balance of power. 
British diplomats and politicians were traditionally preoccupied by the idea of fair balance of strength and influence among European powers, and, the attitude and, explain, and this attitude explains British reluctance to the claims that may have undermined prospects of German reconstruction and development, seen as essential for recovery of the economy of the whole continent. Here we have to remember that prior to the outbreak of, war, of Great War, it was the German market where British goods have gained most profits. Within this British political logic, the only argument which played in favour of Poland's strategic interests and created a common ground with the British reading of geopolitical situation in Europe after the war was the fall of Russia and the Bolsheviks who took power there and created a real threat for the whole continent and its established values. The Brits were very supportive for the Bolsheviks' opponents in Russia. He launched intervention there and tried to broker a political compromise between the white movement, particularly Demikin, and Brussels. But when it failed, they engaged themselves in brokering another, however, a completely different deal, this time between Lenin and Brussels. The main idea behind this attempt was a creation of Poland which would be much more sustainable in the face of both Russian and German, justified in, in the eyes of British politicians educated on 19th-20th 20th century political game rules, revisionist claims against Poland. Here we have to acknowledge, acknowledge that the idea of quick deployment of, of the Harvest Army to Poland, which should be additionally accompanied by the French, British and even honorable troops, were coined in the cabinets of the British Foreign Office as early in December 1980. Then, of course, the plan was postponed and changed due to manoeuvres of British politics during the peace conference and, in particular, regarding Poland. But in, it provides a good illustration of British very ambivalent attitudes towards Poland, with, which had to struggle to find its way to new understanding of common sense uh, in national politics by British elites. Here it's worth to add that Poland's diplomacy played quite skillfully skillful on this British sentiment <coughs> in that time. Now we arrive to the, the case of the United States, which is very special. Washington and particularly President Wilson, who was a herald of the idea of democratization of international politics, our rights of nations for self-determination and creation of Poland with an access to the sea. Here, quote, oh, the food problem. Some American diplomats interpreted um, this um, Woodrow Wilson slogan as a bit for inclusion of city of Gdansk, but without granting Poland the right to use German uh, rail railroads for the transportation of goods from Poland to the city. Um, well, so Wilson was very supportive to Poland during the war and at the peace conference. And American aid for Poland after the war were greatly appreciated and, and, and uh, gratefully remembered. But the prestige of NATO states quickly vanished when it withdrew from European scene. But there is no coincidence that Alexander Szczynski, one of the Polish foreign minister, one of the, in my view, one of the best one to have ever had. Uh, but he paid the visit to the United States as a part of his campaign for granting Poland a seat at the table of local conference. Skrzynski knew very well that his public appearances on the other side of the Atlantic would be carefully followed by English press. So it would allow him to shape and support his arguments, crafty, crafty for the British political consumption. Generally speaking, in the years 1990-1925, it uh, means until the past, Washington still played an important role in Poland's foreign policy, not only as a source of aid, financial and military support, but also as a, cha as a channel of communication with the British public and political elites. 
The rebellion Poland was one of the integral parts and chief beneficiary, beneficiaries of the Versailles Order. Alexander Chinsky, as I said, one, one, of, one of the most outstanding Polish foreign ministers of the interwar period, meant, quote, the Treaty of Versailles means the existence of Poland. And, quote, Poland holds the key to European security. So any combination that tries to ignore this will be doomed to a complete failure. End of quote. The reconstituted Poland, state, constituted Poland state came into the beginning in, in November 1980 as a result of synergy of the force in Paris, London, Washington, and Rome by a national conservative, uh, Narodowa Democrats, and of takeovers of power in the Polish territories by independence-oriented left-wing forces. The ethos of action and the tradition of struggle for one's own state impacted Polish thinking in the realm of international affairs. It was in the line of the Polish reason detached to collaborate with parties in London for stability of the new interna international system. With that goal in March 1921, Poland concluded military alliances with France and Romania, strived for cooperation with Great Britain, and during the first post-war decades, backed the institutions of Versailles system, including the League of Nations. We also assumed that it would be in France's vital interest to defend the European order shaped after World War I. The Polish-French alliance established in the early 20s was a natural consequence of, of the community of strategic interest of these two states, which, however, started eroding soon after the Locarno Treaty in 1925, as, as Locarno enhanced the security of, of countries situated along the Rhine while making Central Europe a regional relatively diminished security. That differentiation drove a wedge into the Polish French alliance and the strategic community of the two states. Uh, practically the day after the Treaty of Versailles was signed, the convention appeared after in London that it would have to be modernized in the future. Uh, I usually use the term modernize rather to, than to reform because after it is much closer to the intention of the proponents of such changes. We also suspected, usually with good reason, that the ideas for fixing the Versailles system floating in London and Paris were underprinted by the concept aimed at the reduction of Poland's territorial, territorial holdings and the instrumentalization of the issue of security in Central Europe. That was a room for manoeuvre for Poland in the first six, five years of its independence in the war period. Um, and I will leave as it is, and I'm open for, for questions, comments during the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.